So this is grand final, grand finale to th the whole two-day session. And according to Michel or Roman, Roman, this is the best one. So let's see financial stability. Uh, our distinguished fellow clearly mentioned oh, we should not see entity but also market in general. We should not see only what's going on now, but we should pers pers perspectively to see in the future. So these panels just enlighten us what's going on, not only specific jurisdiction, but globally and also in the future. Chair, chair oh, to, to this panel is Michelle Fields. Uh, she's new executive committee member since January this year. Michelle is chairman or um, superintendent or commissioner of the Bahamas uh, Insurance uh, Commission. And also she is chairing Caribbean Insurance Association of Insurance uh, Supervisors. So, Michelle, the floor is yours, and we look forward to your panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yoshi. As, as he said, we've saved the best for last, and I want to thank you all for staying to this very last panel. Um, we've talked a lot over the past day and a half um, of specific initiatives of the of the IAIS, and we've talked about uh, implementation, etc. And now we are going to finish the day, finish the event with a, a global perspective. Um, we have four presenters today, and we will have, a, have them do their presentation. Um, we'll have the questions in between. Um, we're going to first start uh, with Dr. Christian Smith, who is the head of macro prudential supervision of the financial. Mark, Financial Market Authority of Liechtenstein. Um, he's been there since November 2009 as the head and chief economist. And um, he began his career at DG Bank in Frankfurt, where he held positions as economist and fixed income analyst. He joined Swiss Re in 2001, and he's a certified European financial analyst and a financial risk manager. Um, so he will then, he will be speaking about the IAIS Global Insurance Market Report. We'll then have a presentation on the IMF Financial Stability Report by Giovanni Cucinetta. I can't say that properly. Um, he serves as the Senior Financial Specialist in Insurance Regulation and Supervision at the IMF. And prior to joining the IMF, he worked for several years in Italian banks and financial markets. He later worked as the manager in the Italian Insurance Supervisory Authority, on behalf of which he attended the IEIS and IOPA meetings. Um, our third presenter will be um, Martin Saenz from Peru. Um, Mr. Sayans is the head of investment supervision department at the, at the SBS of Peru. Um, and he has uh, also been worked at the actuarial side. He, he also leads the risk management compliance teams at supervised entities in Peru in the insurance and banking industry. And he will give us a perspective on uh, catastrophic catastrophe insurance, um, the market in Peru, trends there. And we'll, fi we'll finish off the day uh, with a presentation by Rowan Douglas, who's just come in fresh off the plane. We thank you for being here, um, making the special effort. I understand that he's changed his travel plan so that he can join us this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Douglas is the CEO of Capital Science and Policy Practice at Willis Towers Watson, which is a leading global advisory bank broking and solutions company. He's also the chair of the Willis Research Network. Um, he has held various appointments within the UN and other international organizations, and was appointed as was made a CBE in the 2016 New Year's Honors List. We congratulate him on that. Um, that was for his services to the economy through risk insurance and sustainable growth. So, uh, Mr. Douglas is a member of the UK Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology the Royal Society's Working Group on Re Resilience to climate, climate Risk and Extreme Weather, 
and serves on the Executive Committee of the International Insurance Society, uh, from which he received the Kenneth Black Award in 2014. And he will talk to us about the Insurance Development Forum. So we will start um, our first presentation by uh, Mr. Smith, and we talk about the IAS Global Insurance Market Report. Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction, for the kind introduction. Thank you again also to the Hungarian um, Supervisory Authority for organizing this nice event here in Budapest. Um, thanks also to the IAS for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to um, present some results of the GMAR. And also thanks to the audience here that you still remain at the end of this. Um, long event still here. What I want to do, I want to present you some selected findings of the 2015 Global Insurance Market Report, which is usually abbreviated as GMAR, which is published by the IAIS. The GMAR discusses the global insurance and reinsurance sectors from a supervisory perspective, focusing on the recent performance of the sector as well as key risks faced by it. By providing a financial system-wide assessment of developments and risks, the GMA plays an important role in the IAS new Mark Prudential policy and surveillance framework. Let's see. Yeah, it works. On this slide, I have summarized the main findings of the 2015 Global Insurance Market Report. First of all, the insurance and the reinsurance industry remain functioning and stable. The insurance industry remains well capitalized. In Europe, for example, solvency one ratios of European life and non-life insurance companies remain on average around 200%. In the global reinsurance industry, there is an abundance of capital. According to AIMBEST, total reinsurance capacity amounted to close to 400 billion US dollar in 2014. Internationally, the capital position of the insurance industry has improved over the last few years. There is an ongoing inflow of capital into the industry. Between 2010 and 2015, the total reinsurance capital has increased on average per year by 3.8%, driven mainly by alternative capital, which rose on average by 23.8% per year. Premium growth in the industry is moderate in line with global GDP growth. The IMF estimates that world output in 2015 grew by 3.1%. For comparison, global life insurance premiums have risen by 3.3%, while non-life premiums grew by 2.5% by on an inflation-adjusted basis. The profitability in the insurance industry remains broadly stable. In non-life, various international estimates suggest that combined ratios in Europe and the United States hover between 95 and 98 percent. As long as the combined ratio is below 100 percent, the underwriting of the non-life industry is deemed to be profitable. Furthermore, large euro area insurance companies continue to report solid profitability, with median returns hovering at around 9 percent. The investment yields have been declining gradually over the last couple of years, putting pressure on profitability of the insurance industry. In Europe, insurance average investment yields deteriorated from above 4% to 3.8% in the second quarter of 2015, according to estimates by IOPA. The decline in investment yields is partly due to the low level of interest rates. The insurance industry benefits from relatively benign losses from natural catastrophes. In 2015, losses amounted to 37 billion US dollar, according to Swiss Re. This is well below the 10-year historic average loss of 62 billion. In 2014 and 2013 as well, net cut, net cut losses were at historically relatively low levels. In the last few years, 2014 and 2015, the insurance industry has been subject to a surge in mergers and acquisitions. According to estimates by market participants, more than 10% of the global reinsurance industry is currently involved in major mergers activity. 
all major segments and the main global regions have been affected. While the sector remained broadly stable in 2015, the macro financial risks are increasing as a result of the challenging economic and financial environment in which the insurance companies are currently operating. The main risk for insurers stem from the prolonged low interest rate environment. Since at least the beginning of the 1990s, long-term bond yields have been on a downward path. At that time, market participants used to coin the term Greenspan put, which referred to the US central bank responding to economic and financial turbulences by lowering policy rates with the aim of stabilizing the economy and the markets. In later years, they, they used the term Bernanke put, again referring to the US central bank governor. In response to the global financial crisis, major central banks have further reduced policy rates and then introduced also unconventional policy measures. These included the purchase of financial assets, liquidity provisions, and forward guidance. Key objectives of these policy measures are to bring back inflation to target, to stabilize financial markets, and to foster economic growth. More than half a decade after the end of the recession, central bank policy rates remain at or close to historic lows. And unconventional policy measures are still being applied. Central banks in Europe and Japan have moved their benchmark interest rates below zero. In the meantime, 18%, 18% of the world economy operates in an environment of negative central bank policy rates. The share rises to 40% if you include countries with central bank policy rates up to 1%. A substantial part of the global government bond market is subject to negative yields. Recent estimates suggest that more than 10 trillion US dollars of global government bonds are in negative yielding territory. The average yield of the global government bond market is below 0.7%. Low interest rates put pressure on insurers' investment yields. For live insurers in particular, they pose a significant challenge. This is because traditionally, live insurers sell policies with guaranteed rates and because live insurance policies tend to have a long duration. For non-live insurers, they pose less of a risk, but they also affect their investment yields. Live insurance companies in a number of European countries have issued a substantial share of investment products offering, offering guaranteed returns at rates that are well in excess of current long-term interest rates and backed these guarantees with assets of significantly shorter duration. These firms have a so-called duration gap. The asset duration is lower than the duration of the liabilities. The consequence is that if interest rates fall, the value of their assets and their liabilities increase on a mark-to-market -market basis, but the liabilities rise more than their assets. As a consequence, the economic net worth of the companies decline. The low interest rate environment partly reflects the low expectations for economic growth and inflation. Economic growth forecasts have been revised down repeatedly in recent years. In its latest World Economic Outlook, the IMF once again revises down its expectations for economic growth. The IMF now expects world output to grow by 3.2% in 2016. Emerging markets contributed in the last decade or so a substantial part to global economic growth. However, now, with falling commodity prices, the prospects for economic growth in many emerging markets look rather dim. Furthermore, emerging markets have accumulated a substantial amount of debt. Debt in emerging markets has risen from 150% of GDP in 2009 to 195% in 2015. China's total debt has risen by nearly 50 percentage points in only four years and now exceeds that of the United States. On a global level, debt has risen as well. From 2007 through the second quarter of 2014, the ratio of global debt to GDP has risen by 17 percentage points. Financial markets tend to to be liquid. Normally, it is relatively easy to sell large amounts of financial assets at the market without substantially affecting the price of the assets. That's at least the way it looks. However, various reports indicate that there is an increasing discrepancy between rising demand for liquidity and falling supply. This is particularly the case for fixed income markets. 
in a crisis situation that could lead to substantial swings of market prices with higher financial market volatility. One issue is that dealers have reduced their market making capacity and willingness in many jurisdictions, focusing on activities that require less capital. Demand for market making services in turn continue to grow given the expansion of primary bond markets and increased bond holdings by market participants. So what is the impact of this challenging macro financial environment on the insurance industry? How do insurers respond? Life insurers Life insurance policies often tend to be rather long-term, sometimes a couple of decades. As a result, the average duration of the liability tends often to be higher than the average asset duration. In the current low rate environment, they are subject to substantial interest rate risk. Given that major central banks, like the ECB, buy long-term bonds, we see continued pressure on long-term bond yields. Prices of long-term bond yields, in turn, continue to rise. Thus makes, in principle, sense to increase the asset duration as far as possible. That has two effects. First, investment yields are currently supported as long as longer-term assets gain value. Second, the duration gap is reduced. In the current low interest rate environment, insurers have an incentive also to search for yield, given that crediting rates on liabilities tend to be relatively high. The chase for yield can take various forms. The GMR finds little evidence for a shift to lower rated bonds, which is one of the forms that insurers can take. In the United States, insurers have tended to increase exposure to commercial mortgages, but the invested share in sub-investment grade corporate bonds has tended downward, downwards since 2009. For Europe, we also find no remarkable overall trend towards higher yielding instruments or asset classes visible yet. For Japan, Jima, with reference to research by the Bank of Japan, reports the Japanese life insurers have increased their investments in foreign stocks and bonds, chasing higher investment returns. Japanese companies have also increased the number of foreign acquisitions and investment in foreign companies to size growth opportunities in international markets. Insurers also tend to make adjustments to the product mix and thus to their business model. Life insurers, for example, tend to shift to unit-linked products. Investment risk is here shifted back to the consumer. Insurers benefit because these products are less capital-intensive than traditional products. In Europe, on average, estimates suggest that about 20% of life insurance policies are currently unit-linked products. Some insurers also try to invade the risk market by selling for example, term life products or critical illness type of products. However, the risk market is relatively small and crowded with intense competition. With this, I would like to shift to the non-life insurance business. The non-life insurance and reinsurance industry is affected by excess capacity, capacity and relatively low losses from natural catastrophes. As a result, premium rates tend to be under pressure. The pressure is strongest in U.S. net cat risk business. According to Guy Carpenter, in 2015, the rate online for U.S. net cat business declined by 10.5% after 17% decline in the year before. Other business lines are also affected. Premiums in U.S. commercial lines declined in 2015. In Europe, Asia, and Latin America, prices in commercial insurance are also softening. Given that the demand for insurance is subdued and against the challenging economic and financial environment I just described, the industry also faces pressure on costs and expenses. At this point, I'm almost at the end of my short presentation, but I would like to conclude with some charts that illustrate some of the points that I just mentioned. In this chart, you see the total reinsurance capacity development of the last few years. Reinsurance capacity has increased substantially. The increase is driven mainly by the alternative capacity. That means by cat bonds, collateralized reinsurance, industry loss warrants, and sidecars. Between 2010 and 2015, alternative capacity almost tripled, while traditional reinsurance capital rose only by a small amount. 
The increase in alternative capacity is partly a reflection of the fact that the world is swimming in capital, not only the insurance industry. So it is, in fact, the world that is chasing for yield, not only the insurers. Given that expected returns from ILS products are relatively high and losses have been low, capital continues to flow into the market. The consequence is that in the non-life insurance industry, there's a pressure on premium rates, the prices in non-life. In no other business line, this is more the case than in US net cat business. Here, prices have fallen substantially over the last couple of years. This chart shows you the development of the prices since 2007. In 2006, and that's not on the chart because the number is so high, but in 2006, the rate online rose by 86%. So that was the year after hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma. At that time, prices in the US netcat business exploded almost. Since then, prices have almost fallen continuously. Other business lines in non-life also face pressure on prices, but that is not as strong as in the US netcat business. My final slide is this one. It illus illustrates the development of mergers and, activity, mergers and, and acquisitions activity over the last few years. In this context, I also would like to bring your attention to a special topic that is covered in the GEMA on mergers and acquisitions in, in the insurance industry. M&A after the financial crisis immediately was relatively low, far lower than before the financial crisis. In 2014 and 2015, however, there was a surge of M&A activity in the insurance industry. As I mentioned before, estimates suggest that 10% of reinsurance capacity in 2015 was involved in M&A. But it no, not only affected the reinsurance industry, it also affected insurance intermediaries. There, the M&A activity is driven mainly by scale economies. And that's the result of intermediaries requiring a substantial investments in infrastructure and IT. So there's a, an intense cost pressure again in the current environment. Also in life insurance, we are seeing in, in Europe and the United States an increase in M&A activity, partly a result of financial distress prompting for strategic investments or divestments. In Japan, insurers expanded internationally. We also saw a rising M&A activity in some emerging markets. And in non-life, there have been some large deals announced. For example, in 2015, there was a large deal between Ace and Chubb. The mergers and acquisition activity in that area is partly a result of the alternative capacity, which makes it, which putting price, prices under pressure. With this, I'd like to close my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think that um, the, the GMAR's conclusion overall is that the global insurance market is holding its own. Um, but you spoke with, um, about interest rates and low yield on, on um, investments. So as that continues, what should supervisors be um, looking to do? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think, well, interest rate risk is the main, main topic really for the insurance industry at the moment, in particular for the life insurance industry. From a supervisory perspective, I think it is most important um, the market potential surveillance to intensify the monitoring and the analysis to re reviewing the sector and to understand the risks and the developments in the sector. Um, and I think with this, we are already far in the process of um, mitigating also the risks that arise from the low interest rate environment. Okay, we are going to um, open up the floor for questions. Are there any questions? If not, we'll move on to our next presentation by Giovanni Cucinotto, who is going to um, talk about the IMF's um, Global Financial Stability Report.
Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, IAS, for giving this opportunity. As Joshua said, uh, uh, this is the, the grand finale. I could say in Latin, Duces in fundo, which translation is the sweetest in the end of the meal. I hope to fulfill th this sentence. What we have done, uh, after the crisis of 2008, IMF undertaken uh, twice a year, a global financial stability report, which analyzed the risk in financial environment worldwide, which can be the effect, the cross-sector effect and the systemic importance of each individual sector and each individual region. This year, this report has been focused on insurance sector as a specific chapter dedicated to this area. Okay, right. So, we have not to say to you which is the importance of insurance sector in economy as a great provider of long-term financing to other economic sector, uh, also a provider of, of uh, risk management, which means can, make, can means mutter the, the, the economic activity to go on in, an, in any country. But apart from that, we have my focus on the, the problem of macro prudential super, surveillance and the financial stability as a whole. How uh, we can say in these uh, simplified graphics, there could be two different views about the role of insurance played in, in, in terms of financial stability. On one side, there is a domino view, which means there are relevant single big insurance company, which is, it fails, the effect spread over the, the financial market and the spillover on the other region as well. So it means when in case of crisis, they stop in, 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 in providing financial services in terms of insurance, as well the main function of liquidity offered by insurance sector by means of CUD lending and repo. There's another view, which, uh, which, we, which more I could say no different, but it's a different perspective, which is more focused on, on IMF research and, and, and surveillance. It is a tsunami view, which means not to look at a single company, but the sector as a whole. It means if there is no failure of a single company, because it is a big provider of financial instrument, big investors or long-term horizon, many economic events can come up in the market due to a, a very high volatility, can affect as all these insurance sectors. It can drag on other financial markets or can spill over to other sectors as well as a region. And this has been called as a tsunami view. So it means try to assess which is the common uh, stability effect of, of sorry, insurance sector as a whole in the financial, in the financial market. Briefly, the main finding of the, this uh, 2016 report. Systemic importance. We can see briefly with some uh, graphics, uh, but just to grasp the meaning of what I'm going to say, there has been an, an increased exposure of life insurance especially, but it's still lower than banks. So we saw high exposure, high, could say, systemic importance after the crisis of 2008. We saw a reduction of this importance in terms of uh, statistical analysis. Now we see back, they could say the insurance sector move us together. So they, all the company of the system are affected in the same time and the same manner due to some economic event that can happen in, in the market and the economy. Spillover, which means if the effect from one sector or from one region go toward the other one. In other words, if a sector is a receiver or, or, or sender of financial instability and insurance transmit uh, this kind of, of, of uh, contagion across system, across, you can say this phenomenon is much more relevant for the banks, less for the insurance, and specifically less for insurance life than no life insurance. It is more in the North American region and, and, and Europe than in Asia. We'll see briefly some graphics which give a uh, uh, physical idea. Life insurance asset. We just run no sign of a major shift toward riskier asset, but asset have become riskier. So the impact on the balance sheet and the stability aspect of the insurance market is enhanced in the last couple of, of years. There is a search for yield among weaker and small firms. In other words, they try to regain profits moving toward riskier asset in an environment in which the, the, the expectation of prolonged low interest rate. And there are also <clears throat> macro uh, regulatory implication. Macro prudential approach is needed, so it means not to look only at the micro aspect of insurance company, but also as a macro aspect of insurance company. 
and there is the, the need of international capital and transparency standards and focus on smaller and weaker firms. In this graph, just don't to focus on each of them, on the upper side of this graph, you can see how there's been the covariance index. In other words, we have assessed how the price, the returns of stock prices of insurance company or the banks as well move together due to an uh, economic event. Uh, you can see the graph is the higher peak was in 2008, they reduced and now they're still moving together. The insurance line has the, the, the green one, the banks are the, uh, the red one. So the, the volatility has increased the correlation of the price of insurance company, which means they move together in the, independently of, of, of which company has a business model uh, on its own. You can see the you know, North American is increasing in Europe as well, in Asia much less. If you go in a different measure, capital shortfall, which means which is the capital available, it could be affected on the crisis altogether, which are in excess of the capital required, you can, say, you can see the same effect. The green line is the insurance sector, which is much lower, according to this statistic measure, than banks, but it has increased since 2009 toward 2015. So, investment behavior. The question was, the insurance company in this environment are taking more risk on board. I mean, are investing more risky assets in order to regain profits. So, across us categories, truly on for weak and smaller firms, this is our outcome of our research. Increasingly, increasing similarity in asset composition is not apparent across markets and across regions. Greater procyclicality in investment behavior, the mixed evidence. In some regions, it does increase the procyclicality of insurance sector, in other regions, not. But there is a key point. Greater common exposure to aggregate risk, which means they move together with interest rate movement and with interest rate volatility. So as a whole, has increased the systemic importance of insurance sector. So changing market dynamics, briefly to summarize. Temporary factors could see search for yield, lower risk aversion. So it means higher correlation and more similarity of insurance stocks. And structural change on the other side, we would say, increasing risk of market liquidity, a benchmarking more weather well spreading. Means they could say a kind of behavior, uh, herding behavior of insurance company that try to move in the same kind of asset at investment. And so as a whole, they're affected when some economic variable in financial market change abruptly. So the lesson for regulation, we, we draw on this study. A macro potential approach is absolutely needed. Address risk related to common exposure. Market consistent valuation standard enhance transparency, address duration mismatch. Give just an example. I mean, a market valuation approach can incorporate my, my much more volatility in a stable uh, interest rate environment. On the other end, in the, in the many SAP we have undertaken, countries will adopt different valuation techniques. They, they appear less affected by interest rate. So we have to balance two different valuation approach to assess the riskness or the systemic impact of insurance market as a whole. Supervisory. Uh, approach or supervisory suggestion. They have to follow up smaller and the weaker firms. They can take in more risk, it seems to be, according to our research. Folks should be not restricted to only large firms. A too many to fall problem should be a part of the story. And also pay attention to the contagion which has increased according to our statistics exercise. And finally, vigilance or supervision should avoid regulatory ab arbitrage across sector and across region. These are the main message sent out from IMF. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if you have any questions first. Um, you talked about the, the tsunami approach uh, versus the domino um, approach, which was, I guess, the more traditional way of looking at, at the uh, risk and insurance companies. So is the IMF now more focused on the cross-sectoral um, um, relationships between, um, with insurance companies? Uh, ab absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, traditionally, IMFs have been focused on macro phenomenon of international economy. 
So to this, in this extent, in this, in, in this purpose, the main focus is uh, the effect of sector as a whole. So not to, to, to look at individual banks or individual insurance or individual market, but as a whole, so the world, this is the transmission, a contagion from sectors and from region. So this one is not something we dismiss the approach domino with say, but it's something which integrate with the different perspectives as macro potential surveillance. So we'll see more of the um, analysis in the insurance sector in the, in, from the IMF um, going forward. I mean, the main focus, as was, was mentioned uh, probably in this discussion, was in FISAP, we are more focused on the micro prudential aspect. It does not mean only the macro macro, but also some micro uh, aspect that will affect the behavior of the company and the market as a whole. Okay. I and mean, do we have questions from the audience? Yes, there's currently $2 trillion of variable annuities with guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefits, which effectively are endorsements that guarantee a market return or a lack of a market loss. <clears throat> and uh, companies are introducing a new product called a contingent deferred annuity, which provides that guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefit market return guarantee for investments that stay with the investment advisor. The, the assets don't even have to be transferred to the insurance company. And th that market is projected at $10 trillion. Um, so my question is, um, are there data available to either supervisors or the IMF um, to evaluate the counterparty risks of the hedging that's required to provide those market return guarantees. And um, the second part of it, the question would be, um, if that's determined to pose systemic risk, um, none of the company, well, the overwhelming majority of that business is written by companies that are not designated as um, systemically important. So given that, a, capital requirement for a systemic, systemically important insurer would have no effect on them. Um, what are the tools to address that type of systemic risk if it were so evaluated? Thank you very much. Briefly, the first question has been assessed the uh, U.S. market. Has it been in the last year, I'm not sure about that, was being ended the FSAP on the U.S. And the U.S. insurance market has been uh, uh, on the stress Test, which means that there have been a, some, some negative assumption, very extreme event, but not unreliable. And there has been a steady effect just to measure which could be the impact of the structure of the U.S. market with this kind of product. The tendency should try to avoid to, to, to be a good stick to this kind of product. So try to, the risk in some extent, to offer product with the risk is that to some extent is transferred to other market and closely monitoring the volatility, the increased volatility. Monitoring, what does it mean? It means try to hedging or to reduce, for instance, the maturity gap. All these measures try to avoid to, to expose much more the, the, the sector to this uh, negative event or a high volatility. So I lost the second question. So given that most of these products are sold by companies that are not designated as significantly important, uh, capital requirement for a significantly important insurer would have no effect on that. What are the other tools in the supervisory toolbox to address that systemic risk? As I mentioned before, some instrument can be try to monitor much better the um, duration mismatching, for instance, try to implement more uh, stress tests in order to assess which would be the risk in the change environment, and also implement some aging policy, aging strategies. And the third solution we try to structure a new product which has less effect by this phenomenon. So I could say kind of the risking from insurance sector. If it could seem a contradiction, it's the only way to reduce the impact of volatile environment on the insurance balance sheet.
Thank you, Hugh Saville, Association of British Insurers. If I can summarize, insurers have not gone further down into risky assets, but the assets we already own have become riskier. Given that we're not supposed to behave pro-cyclically, what are we supposed to do about that? I don't want, I'm not, sorry, I don't want to repeat what I said before, but more or less it, it, the same receipt. I mean, try to de-risk the insurance sector. That means reduce, you know, the risk is much higher when the higher is the negative duration between asset and liabilities. Try to offer a product which is not a uh, guarantee rate. So because now the key point is the interest rate risk, which is expected to be low for a prolonged period of time. And other measures, I, I don't know what can suggest, I mean, other measures about that. Just monitoring carefully what's happened at the sector and how the sector is affected as a whole by movement in stock prices or oil prices. So, so this kind of things can affect as a whole this, this sector. It could be negative impact on the market as a whole. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we'll move on to Peru and talk about the um, catastrophic uh, insurance in Peru. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for the introduction. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for your time. Um, Christian and Giovanni uh, introduce us uh, um, how the different kind of risks are affecting our insurance markets and also not only the insurance market, but also our economies. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about one uh, specific risk that uh, we face and how we could impact uh, to, especially to developing economies, which is the um, natural catastrophe risk. Um, before starting, I want to, to thank uh, IAS, the Hung uh, Hungarian Authority, um, we are um, we are uh, thank that uh, you invited Peru to to make this uh, presentation. Um, and uh, before continuing, uh, I wanted to to highlight that the scope of this talk uh, is uh, catastrophe insurance in Peru. Um, there are many other developments that are improving the disaster risk management in Peru, which are not uh, under the scope of this talk. Uh, but I, I'm going to mention uh, some of them at the end of this uh, presentation. So uh, during this talk, uh, I am going to talk about the natural catastrophe risks, uh, which are the main uh, risk, um, risk factors that we, fa we face in Peru. Um, we are going to see how Peru is, uh, has this uh, gap uh, considering the, the, um, the exposure we have and how the, the level of uh, um, the insured assets that are, uh, we have in Peru. And we are going to, um, to see some figures about the, the evolution of our um, insurance market, especially uh, the, the catastrophe insurance uh, protection. Then uh, I am going to talk about, uh, about the seismic vulnerability assessment, which is a tool that uh, uh, has allowed us to improve uh, the underwriting of our uh, catastrophe insurance in Peru, and also to improve our um, uh, regulation about reserving uh, uh, against the catastrophe uh, events in, in Peru. Uh, then I'm going to talk about briefly about the, the regulation, and finally, I'm going to talk about the, the lessons that we have learned and the next steps that we are following. So, first, uh, I need to say that, well, Peru is a, is a beautiful country. Uh, we are a rich country in terms of uh, natural resources and natural diversity. In these pictures, you, you can see as just a small sample how rich is our country in terms in that terms. But yes, always is there's a but. <laughs> the, uh, we are highly exposed to natural disasters. 
uh, like earthquakes, the phenomenon of El Nino, uh, floods, serious landslides. Uh, and these uh, natural uh, catastrophes not only causes losses uh, uh, for us in terms of uh, human lives and in terms of property damages, but also inhibit our social um, and economic development. According to recent uh, international studies, Peru uh, ranks at the, on the top of the list uh, of countries exposed to natural disasters. As you can see here in the slides, we are top eight in worst natural catastrophes uh, uh, losses in terms of victims in the last 40 years. We, we also top number two in average, uh, annual average losses uh, from earthquakes in relation to capital stock. And we top uh, number six in earthquakes, uh, PML 500, which is the probable maximum loss in a 50-year uh, period uh, with a per probability of 10% uh, in relation to our capital stocks. So we are highly exposed to nat natural catastrophe, especially earthquakes. And at the same time, we have a gap in terms of protection. Uh, as many other countries in Latin America, uh, we have, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the insured uh, properties and assets in Peru uh, is less than the, the 20%. You know, in Latin America, uh, according to the studies of uh, Swiss Re, the 88% 80 per, would be uninsured uh, uh, if we have a, an earthquake. But in Peru, the, um, the market penetration, the, the market presentation of uh, insurance is, is lower than the, uh, in our region. So we, we believe that uh, we, we, uh, uh, our exposure, exposure is higher. And according to the United Nations, uh, well, uh, one of the last studies, uh, it points out that Peru, as many other countries, developing, especially developing countries, would not pass a stress test of uh, our fiscal uh, resilience uh, to a one in a hundred years loss. So that is very serious. But we have good news. <laughs> so I, I mentioned some bad news, but we have good news. Uh, we have um, um, the evolution of our markets uh, of our insurance market uh, in the last uh, in the past 10 years uh, has been very dynamic uh, we have a, a higher uh, market penetration and also the the, um, the um, premiums in, in our market uh, our market uh, uh, are growing in a co consistent basis and our potential is also very high so uh, for example um, in the past 10 years, our insurance market penetration has grown uh, by 50 basic points. You, maybe it, it sounds little for you, but uh, our it, in, uh, 10 years ago, it was just 1.5% uh, of our GDP. So now it's close to 2%. So it's, it's, a, it's a very important uh, growth. Uh, the, the written premiums, the compounded annual growth rate in written premiums in the past th uh, 13 years, in real terms, uh, uh, was uh, in average uh, 13%. So this is a very dy dynamic um, uh, mark. And also according, according to the Swiss Re uh, uh, some study, uh, it highlights that the, the potential that um, in our market penetration is very high. Uh, it would be four times our uh, current value. So, uh, now I'm going to talk about, uh, sorry, the seismic vulnerability assessment, uh, which has been uh, one of the most significant factors uh, or tools that uh, has contributed 
uh, to the development of the catastrophe insurance in, in Peru. Uh, it was uh, initiated by the insurance sector. Yes, uh, they, uh, it was a, um, um, they, they initiated that, uh, that study uh, with the, um, uh, and it was carried out by, by the Seismit, which is the Peruvian Japanese Center of Seismic, uh, Seismic Investigation and Disaster Mitigation uh, from the National University of uh, Engineering. Uh, so this study was initiated in 2003, and uh, it was delivered in two, 2005. Uh, this study uh, was um, also delivered with the help of uh, uh, Swiss and Mexican experts. And it is important to mention that before this study, uh, how did the, the, the insurance companies underwrite the, the catastrophe uh, um, risk? Um, they, they used um, one, a single factor model that was uh, uh, reflected in our, in our um, regulation, reserving regulation, uh, that um, they, uh, it used um, a factor of 50% and then a factor of uh, 10%. Uh, to estimate the, the PML. So, uh, I'm sorry. This study is also worth it to mention that this study was monitored by the, the, the SBS. Um, and the main goal was estimate the seismic PML of, uh, from insurance properties in Lima and Callao. Well, why Lima and Callao? Because uh, there is, that is uh, the region where, uh, where more than the 50% of insurance assets are located. So the general approach uh, of this um, study uh, was dividing the area, the Lima and Callao area, in five zones in order to analyze the risk of each of these by relating the intensity of seismic, seismic movements resulting to the subsurface uh, geological uh, conditions uh, to the building's uh, standards. Uh, the result of study, uh, well, the, the study resulted in a model which consider many variables. Uh, and finally, it, it allowed the, the PML estimation based on the structure, uh, vulnerability, and the risk uh, for each area under consideration. So it was a, a big change. Like uh, in, in before this study, the, the PML was uh, estimated used, using just a, a single factor. And now this study allowed us to, uh, uh, to estimate better our, the, the risk that uh, we were uh, facing. Um, about the, the implementation of this study, um, the insurance companies uh, in an annual basis, um, they need to, to update their uh, PML analysis and they um, deliver that, that with the, well, the, the analysis is carried out by experts of, uh, of consulting firms, um, which should be registered uh, by the Peruvian authority. On the registry process uh, to those firms, uh, the SBS considers the background and experience um, of the group of experts of uh, each firms. So these uh, groups of ex ex experts has, um, have um, actuaries, uh, also uh, civil engineers, and also geologists. And as can be imagined, the final results of all of this work uh, was more precise PML estimations, better and more coherent insurance offer, and more precise reserving values that at the end have produced higher earthquake uh, catastrophic uh, protection. So about the regulation, as I mentioned before, uh, in the 90s, 
the reserving regulation for uh, catastrophe insurance uh, was based in, in a single factor model. It was uh, first 15% um, is the, the, the factor we used, and then 10%. And this uh, type of um, regulation was developed uh, taking into account uh, the, the regulation in different peers of our uh, uh, region, and also considering um, prudent, uh, prudential um, well, um, principles. And um, so the, 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 the estimation of a catastrophe, a catastrophe reserves, um, as you can imagine, they were very rough approximation of the current uh, expected losses. And they produced an unrealistic cata uh, catastrophe reserving, which led to lower ma marketability conditions uh, for er earthquake protection. But then, uh, based on the, the seismic vulnerability assessment, uh, we could improve our regulation. We could, um, based uh, the, 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 the way how the insurance companies could estimate their, their PML, which is the base of the research, catastrophe reserves, um, using this uh, uh, model allowed by the, this uh, uh, SVA, which is uh, the seismic uh, vulnerability assessment. So now, the PML analysis depend on individual, uh, depend on individual insured properties and their uh, geographic uh, distribution. What the insurance companies uh, need to do is to, well, now we have a, a very extensive uh, database with information of each, each insured asset, where it's located and what kind of uh, um, uh, building cost, uh, codes uh, have been uh, uh, taken in, into account uh, for these uh, kind of uh, assets and many other uh, variables. So uh, the resulting, well, uh, after this uh, regulation, the P PML uh, in the industry has uh, dropped. Uh, well, before, before that it was 15% uh, or 10% or, or, or depending on, on the, the factor. And then uh, after the regulation, the PML uh, in average in the industry have dropped uh, to 4-3% uh, in 2015. So, uh, what, I have, uh, what have uh, we seen? Um, our, uh, the, the, um, the insured values in Peru against uh, earthquakes have, uh, as you can see, uh, increased um, significantly. Uh, in Lima and Callao, the insured values has increased uh, in average in th uh, almost 14% in past uh, 10 years annually. You know, this is an, uh, a compounded annual growth rate. And uh, in, in Peru, um, it has uh, grown uh, m more than 15% annually. So, uh, of course, it's, it's important to recognize that uh, this growth is, is not only explained by, by this new regulation. It's, it's definitely, we need to, uh, first, we need to uh, consider that our economy has grown uh, in a consistent uh, basis uh, in, the past, in the past years. And this uh, grown in, uh, growth in, the, in our economy has allowed uh, our uh, middle class also to grow, and uh, of course, that has a an, an direct impact in our, in our insurance market. Um, but uh, it's important to, to see also that this, um, this new regulation based on the seismic uh, vulnerability assessment has uh, also uh, had an impact, uh, a positive I impact in our uh, insurance market. So, as you can imagine, um, we are happy, but uh, we are not satisfied, uh, since there are uh, still many other areas to, to improve. Yeah, I have uh, has thought only of just uh, one, one point. 
Uh, for example, at present, um, we, are, we, we have an uh, ongoing project to refine the, um, the SBA, refine the, the, well, the model, the factors, uh, and we also uh, want to uh, include not only the earthquake uh, risk, but also the tsunami risk in, uh, in this, uh, this area, which is also important. You know, the, the, the Peru is in, in the, uh, well, in the, the coast of, of South America, so we are exposed to, to tsunamis. Um, so in this, uh, uh, this Korean project, uh, we are updating the data uh, from Lima and Callao and including this tsunami factor. Um, and now this project is, is uh, led by the Peruvian Authority, uh, but the, the insurance companies are participating and the, the study is carried out by the CISMIT and we expect to, to complete this study uh, next year. So which are the main lessons that we have obtained in all, uh, this, uh, um, all of this? Uh, first, well, I, I believe that um, we notice that it is crucial that the engagement of the authority and the different stakeholders of our insurance market to develop improvements uh, in the insurance industry. Um, then, uh, well, as, as I mentioned, the, the first SBA was promoted by the insurance companies and now the, the Peruvian Authority has uh, leading participation in this topic. So the, S, the SBS um, uh, believe that it is going to, we are going to maintain uh, this, this leading uh, position in the future and we want to uh, continue developing uh, better tools uh, that helps the, um, the industry uh, to, to promote a better underwriting of um, uh, catastrophe risk. Um, we also con uh, confirm that the data is, is crucial. You know, the, the all of these uh, uh, innovations in our uh, market uh, wouldn't, um, well, we could uh, achieve that because of the, uh, all of the, the advances in databases uh, uh, of insured uh, properties. So uh, this, and we also learned that it, uh, we should uh, um, improve these tools on a consistent and ongoing basis. You know, it's, it's, it's important to, to take into account you, you continuously need to uh, revise to refine the model and uh, include uh, other factors. Uh, so uh, to conclude, um, I am, I'm going to highlight uh, our next steps. Uh, first, we, we want to expand the scope of the assessment of our vulnerabilities. Uh, we want to uh, increase the scope of our seismic vulnerability assessment to other uh, major uh, cities in Peru. As I mentioned, it was the current assessment is, is from Lima and Callao, so we want to include other uh, regions that they are highly exposed uh, to earthquakes. Uh, we want to improve our assessment of our vulnerability to other natural catastrophes, uh, such as the phenomenon of El Nino, or landslides, for example, or, or flooding. flooding. Um, and these tools are, uh, will allow us to, to improve our regulation of cat reserving. Uh, it's also uh, important to recognize that um, our government, uh, not only the, the, the SBS, but other entities uh, from our govern government are working to improve uh, the protection uh, of our country against natural uh, catastrophes. In terms of, of insurance, the, the Ministry of uh, Economics and Finances uh, are, uh, is leading these, uh, these projects. Uh, one of them uh, wants to improve the catastrophic, uh, catastrophic coverage for straight, uh, state properties. So uh, they are uh, developing and implementing a national financing strategy for uh, catastrophic losses. Uh, one of the um, initiatives uh, is to centralize the management for insurance protection of public uh, assets for state assets. Um, 
another in initiative is to implement uh, insurance pooling uh, for catastrophe coverage. And also, uh, if, um, our government is working to um, improve the uh, catastrophic agricultural insurance protection. Uh, um, nowadays, um, our government is financing a uh, catastrophic agricultural insurance uh, for producers which are below the poverty line. But we want to, to extend that to other uh, um, producers. And as I mentioned I, in, uh, um, um, at the starting and point of my presentation, uh, we have many other developments in Peru, not, on not only in the insurance uh, um, uh, in, in insurance uh, industry, but also uh, in terms of our uh, whole uh, um, uh, nation. We we have in, in 2010. Um, we uh, in Peru uh, implement, well, design and start implementing a national uh, policy for catastrophic risk management. Then it, it, uh, it was followed by the creation of a uh, SINAGERT, which is a national system for disaster and risk manage, uh, management. In 2014, uh, it was developed and uh, they started implementation of a the plan ahead, which is a national plan for disaster and risk management. And uh, in the last year, uh, it was um, uh, produced um, an operational continuity national plan. So the, these, all of these are uh, important milestones that uh, we have achieved to improve, uh, uh, improve our national, uh, our catastrophe uh, risk management. Uh, so uh, uh, here I'm recommending some readings. If you are interested in, uh, interested in these topics, you have uh, you can uh, um, you can find um, important uh, um, papers from the United Nations uh, about the, our experience implemented these these all, uh, all of these uh, milestones for uh, improving our uh, national uh, our catastrophe risk ma uh, management. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm including, I, I know that you are, uh, we are going to share the, with you the presentation, so I included some uh, annex with uh, interesting uh, data. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much. I think that was a very informative um, presentation, and we see that there's been a lot of, of work being done in Peru, and a lot of growth in the insurance sector. Um, I guess, um, you, you, although you, you, you've been doing a lot of assessment, has there also been some um, mitigation um, strategies implemented with regards to zoning and um, um, building codes? Yeah, yes, yeah, of course. As I, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, well, it was focused on the in, in insurance protection. But uh, in our country, we have designed and we, are, uh, ad we have adopted a national strategy for uh, disaster uh, risk ma management. So, which includes many initiatives, many, many products, uh, projects. So, some of them are, uh, we are improving uh, our building codes um, uh, and also the, how we, we well, the, the sonification of the, 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 the homes are the, you know, the infrastructure. Uh, and others, uh, 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 and other initiatives. So for example, it's very uh, important to highlight the, this uh, national uh, plan uh, for financing the, uh, uh, the disaster losses. Um, and also it's important to mention that uh, uh, in our country, Nowadays, uh, when we are uh, analyzing uh, the um, where to um, how, where to develop or how to develop, develop um, investment in, in infrastructure, we are considering the potential uh, well the risks um, or the potential damages from the the catastrophic uh, risks. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our last pre pre presentation for the day. And so we'll now hear from... Um, <laughs> so sorry. Thanks, Michelle. And, uh, uh, we'll talk about the Insurance Development Forum. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, and, uh, and thank you to Stephen and Yoshi for the invitation. I, I really am, I think, the last, the, la the last act before the final session. Also, um, actually really ple pleased to follow um, uh, Christian and Jit Giovanni um, and, uh, and Martin's speeches, because I think I'm going to amplify, um, actually, all of the themes that you've touched on um, a, a wee bit. Um, so as it's the end of the day, I'm going to try and start with a few uh, startling observations. So the first one is, um, I was lucky enough to be um, actually speaking this morning at an event in London. It was the annual meeting, must be the day for annual meetings, of, uh, of Chatham House. Um, that's the sort of arguably, I guess, say that the, I guess maybe one of the most influential think tanks in the world. And they're having their big meeting and they, they kindly asked me to speak, but uh, and it was their meeting about global trends, global risks. And they asked me to speak, not really because of me, but they asked me to speak for two reasons. One, the views of a, of a reinsurance risk monger on the future of risk and big trends. But that wasn't really why they wanted me to speak. The main reason they wanted me to speak was how to confront these. And they wanted me to speak on the role of insurance as an institution of society. I don't just mean an institution like the IMF or the UN, although actually that is quite important, but an institution, an organizing framework for communities, both local and global, to understand risk, to come up with shared rules of behavior, uh, and to share that risk through mutual, cooperative, public-private means uh, as a platform for sustainable growth and actually human dignity. So that's the first shocking observation. Um, and I dare say many of you will be invited to places like that, particularly as policy makers and regulators. Second startling observation was actually on Tuesday morning in Singapore, where um, a couple of senior UN figures uh, and World Bank figures, uh, Quentin Coolen said in front of the IIS, International Insurance Society's annual meeting, clearly the week for annual meetings, to an audience of 500 insurance folks, um, insurance is the big new idea. You're the new kids on the block. And he didn't say it out of, um, they don't fly to Singapore just for any reason. It had come on the back of two summits hosted by Ban Ki-moon in the UN headquarters in the last 12 months, and the integration of insurance in the major global agreements last year on climate and sustainable development. And the reason he said that was because insurance has become an organizing framework to actually respond to these issues. The third um, startling observation before I um, get to the meat in the sandwiches is a report produced by uh, Anna Gonzalez at the University of Cambridge uh, uh, with uh, your own Sebastian von Dahlen, formerly economic counselor of the IAIS, with a title which is easy to find on the internet if you search insurance and human rights. It says, Insurance Regulation for Sustainable Development, Protecting Human Rights of Life, Livelihood and Shelter Against Climate Risks and Natural Hazards. Now in this book they do two things. They um, map the Sustainable Development Goals and other major policy frameworks of last year and show that essentially 11 out of 17 global goals are absolutely fundamentally, um, can only be responded to by insurance or insurance is a critical component of their delivery. The second thing they show, partly through the work here but elsewhere, is that you cannot have sustainable development and resilient societies without an insurance mechanism of some kind. And I don't just mean insurance in terms of the, 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 the financial recompense, it's the entire system of, of resilience that sustainable insurance systems create. But insurance is a regulated activity, so ergo, if countries and governments and the heads of state are going to meet their objectives, insurance regulation becomes an absolutely primary policy mechanism for delivering uh, those goals. The world is changing, and some of us are so close to the coalface, we, we, we don't always um, realize. And they're not doing it out of, um, not just doing it out of the blue. 
um, they've recognized that in the last quarter of a century, our industry has gone from relative ruin at a global level to relative resilience. So I, I entered uh, Lloyd's of London after my postgrad degree in September 1992. I think that was a month or two after Hurricane Andrew hit the east coast of the States. It was the final death knell, or the final punctuation mark on six or seven years of unprecedented losses from US lawyers, Mother Nature. And as we all know, the market was uh, utterly dislocated. And yet 25 years later, as uh, I think Christian showed, uh, certainly in the non-life uh, sector, we're awash with capital. In some ways, we're, we're, we're so resilient, and yet risk has grown. What's happened? Three things came together. Smart capital, both from the private as well as the public and mutual sector, which demanded it had to be sensitive to risk in a new way. The second building block was an analytical and scientific revolution which has not just changed the techniques in our sector, actually built upon engineering principles, but it's changed the very demography of the people who work in my company and I'm sure work in your supervisory and regulatory departments. But the third revolution is the people in this room. And I know you get beaten up by folks from the industry, so I'm not going to beat you up. I'm going to do the opposite. It was a regulatory revolution. Someone said, what should be the tolerance level of an insurance contract? Because for the first time in 300 years, structurally, they're not working. And no one had ever asked that question. No one even had a metric or a lexicon for answering it. So someone said, should it be one in 10,000 years, like a nuclear power station, this contract will be almost, you know, unbelievably resilient. Now, that's a bit high. They said, should it be one in 100 years, like a bridge? And that felt a bit low. And as we all know, over a global convention emerged, I know America marches to a slightly different beat, Stephen, but broadly speaking, insurance contracts must be resilient to one in 200 year, 0.5% annual extremes. Ergo, companies must be capitalized, not just a natural hazard risk, but the entire, the entire spectra of risk. An unbelievable level of regulatory requirement. And asthmatically, over the last 20 years, we have tried to figure out what that means. And basically, in the last 25 years, and we've probably spent $20 billion doing it one way or another, we have simply moved from understanding risk from the history of experience to understanding risk through understanding risk and integrating that into the very mainstream of our capital management, our valuation, and our regulation. It is a stroke of genius that last 25 years and as the rest of the world begins to grope with what we face as existential threats a quarter of a century and have now broadly speaking mastered the rest of the world as these become material risks is struggling for an answer and we actually have that answer if only we knew it but others are now knocking on our door the tragedy, of course, is that we have a terrible lack of demand of our incredible ultimate community product. Our rules and approaches are not adopted more broadly. And we all have a challenge of growth and influence. Well, things are changing. Is this the, um, is, this, is, that, is that the thing? Is that the thing? What do I press? Green. What's that? Oh, green, green, a green arrow is probably a good clue. Right. So. Ultimately, you can talk to a CEO, a prime minister, they all want one thing. Understand risk to create a resilient platform for sustainable growth. Understand risk to create a resilient platform for sustainable growth. Um, I won't go into this slide in too much depth, but on the, on the 14th of uh, April, a new international institution was born. It's called the Insurance Development Forum. It's chaired by um, uh, Stephen Catlin, uh, an, in, an industry figure many of you will have heard of, uh, co-chaired by um, Wakim Levy, CFO of the World Bank, former finance minister of Brazil, and Helen Clark, uh, number three at the UN uh, and head of the UNDP. It has on it um, a pretty stellar cast. It has uh, 13 or 14 top industry CEOs. It has the three global brokers at CEO level. It has Mr. Mark Carney, who I'm sure you all uh, know, know, know and love, and uh, as chair of the FSB. Uh, and a wide range of others. 
And their mission is, is really very simple. It's a, to apply insurance-related capabilities to respond to the post-2015 agenda. That's the Paris Climate Summit. That's the Sustainable Development Goals. That's the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk, which I, thought I saw some, uh, some, uh, uh, some of Martin's slides uh, referring to the ISDR figures on the GAR. It is to say whether it's using our incredible scientific gearbox that no one else has to understand risk, whether it's to create mechanisms for sharing it and, and regulatory and other rules to help people manage it, whether it's to use our, um, in many parts of our business, our significant sources of long-term, supposedly smart, risk-sensitive capital to be a key engine of sustainable investment and growth. The insurance sector is absolutely crucial in achieving at a global level, a national level, and indeed a local level, the primary policy and economic objectives that brought the world together four or five times last um, year at various agreements. It has a very simple mission, understanding risk to create resilient platforms for sustainable growth and human dignity. That is our job as insurers and insurance regulators. If our mission in life doesn't respond to that, we're doing something wrong. I think I've already touched on this. It really is an unprecedented coming together of science, policy, and capital. It meets three or four times a year. It meets on the margins of the IMF spring meetings in April in Washington, which is where we had our first meeting. It meets on the margins of the UN General Assembly in New York. It uh, meets in the margins of the Davos uh, WEF meeting in January uh, and uh, at the IIS annual forum. It is time to locate our sector in the policy mainstream. We shouldn't be on the margins of these meetings, we should be leading them. Just come back from Singapore where um, upon the uh, creation of this vehicle on the 14th of April, um, eight working groups were established to report back to the steering group in September with real proposals which will mobilize public and private um, uh, support and investment. The initial focus of this group uh, is climate and natural hazard risk. That is an initial anchor but not a boundary. Ultimately, I expect that this, this, this uh, vehicle will apply to health challenges, to wider uh, economic uh, challenges, whether it's around retirement and the rest. But we start with climate and natural disaster resilience. The working groups are around risk modeling and mapping. To your point, Martin, uh, why doesn't, why is it only 100 countries in the world have access to the tools that we use to model and understand natural disaster risk, which is actually another name for climate risk? Why is it only our sector that has access to these tools? Why is it that only insurance companies have to report their one in a hundred year exposure to these risks? Which ties in with um, advances in, uh, I won't go down the whole list, regulation, investment, the role of insurance in the global humanitarian system, a $20 billion a year system which is broken. Amazing call went out at the Humanitarian Summit in the UN in Turkey a month ago, a call by charities and the World Food Program and others calling on governments to support and where appropriate subsidize um, insurance premiums in, with, for certain programs as a better way of spending donor aid. So the initial focus of this group is, is risk, regulation, risk sharing, uh, risk resilience working groups I've talked about. Well, what's exciting is this aims to be a forum that brings us all together, and this begins a dialogue. I know we were lucky enough to have the Bermudian regulator in Singapore with us uh, and others, but uh, I'm delighted that this may entertain a, a conversation with the IAS centrally, but of course, local and regional regulators and supervisors. But my passion is the, the, the techniques that you have developed over the last 20 years are now imported in a, where app appropriately into banking and securities regulation and wider accounting. We will not achieve the goals we need in the next 15 or 20 years of resilient, sustainable economies and communities until in the right way that is done. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think that was a very interesting way to finish our day. Um, do we have questions from the audience? I, I know that, um, sorry. Thank you. Um, this is sort of includes yesterday's stakeholders session and it touches a little bit upon what everybody said starting with the report and the liquidity in the reinsurance market. Um, but I think it's particularly addressed to the IMF, which um, I'm just wondering if the IMF has looked at this in terms of what we mentioned yesterday, reinsurance, localization, or protectionism. That's occurred over the last few years. So over 20 countries have imposed some kind of reinsurance localization requirements. It, what, ends up, what ends up happening in some of these markets is they require you to have reinsurance locally, they have an event, there's no capacity, and then they go to the IMF to get taxpayer funds to pay for the event when there's, the, the market is flush with reinsurance capital. So I'm, I'm wondering if the IMF is looking at that, which is a real occurrence. It's not something theoretical. That's something we try to address theoretical problems. This is a problem that's happening right now. And Peru's doing a great job, but some of their neighbors uh, are not doing what Peru is doing. So I'm wondering if the IMF is going to look at this issue in, in more, more detail. Thank you for the question. There is not a specific commitment on the insurance sector but there is a strong commitment for climate change. Our IMF can be involved in the climate change with some specific area of the world. I'm referring to the Caribbean area or the Samoa or uh, far, uh, far Pacific area. So there's, there's, a, there's a group which is working on this, uh, this, on this scope. In the in a wider um, main scope uh, issued by G20 about climate change, it could be the impact on financial sector and how can try to smooth the effect on this sector. So there, there are some work in progress. Uh, I'm not sure if in the next, uh, or in a couple of months, G20, the first uh, proposal or first uh, analysis will be brought about. George? Maybe, maybe just to add on this. Um, um, because the IAS also is looking at this, so maybe it's worth to, worthwhile to mention this in this context that the IAS is currently thinking about um, including this in the future work, just as information. Um, I had a question that goes to how all this conversation gets uh, play outside of this room, and specific to Christian, whether the work of the uh, macroprudential um, policy and surveillance subcommittee is finding its way into conversations with the FSB and higher to G20 and finance ministers that are setting monetary policy that's creating this environment that we're in. And I'll, I'll, par I'll um, asterisk that with Rowan's comments, which is actually obviously very encouraging because you bring a very encouraging demeanor to the conversation. So linking insurance with some of the major risks is spot on and we just have to get about the business of doing it. But it's the policy making side to make sure that the story of all this playing out in the sector is actually getting to the people that have also have responsibility in it. As I, as I got the microphone I'll start and then I'll hand over to Christian. Um, th th thank you George. Um, in a nutshell I put it like this. In the last 25 years, our industry is broadly speaking being cleaned up. And you've done a lot of help there. Um, but now, we collectively have to enable this uh, sorted out industry to primarily flourish. And that's going to require um, the right sort of dialogue, the right sort of fora. And actually, we're not needing it to flourish so that you do well and we do well. The world needs this sector to flourish. 
whether it's on its asset management side or its risk management side. It's an absolute imperative. And one thing we have to do is change our language. So I'm a reinsurance risk monger. I used to look after analytics at Woodisry, so I talk about NatCat all the time. I'm afraid I don't talk about NatCat because no one's listening. If we talk about how we have the tools to help people manage climate risk, which is informed by, obviously, is influenced by climate change, then people start listening. We have to have the confidence to mainstream our language in the mainstream debates. And if we do that, I think to George's point, we will not just be invited, we will be actually seen as the policy, coherent policy solution, which will draw us all forward into a much richer, um, not just dialogue, but role. Yeah, and with regard to the work of the Marco Prudential Working Group, um, one in our mandate there is, um, uh, it contains that we are working closely in cooperation with the IMF, for example, with other institutions internationally. And through this cooperation, we intend also to deliver our messages to these stakeholders and also um, to the outside world through, for example, the Global Insurance Market Report. And we definitely aim to intensify and, and, and always to improve this type of um, engagements.